that. We're reviewing it and hopefully in the new year we'll be able to set up some face-to-face -face meetings. Okay, enough of me waffling about the Badger Group. Um, on to tonight's meeting. Um, Harriet said to put your questions into the Q&A and uh, Pam and myself will deal with them at the end. Um, I know Tim from Rutland Water, where I volunteer. Uh, he's joined us in the last year from uh, Nottingham uh, Wildlife Trust. So a coup for Leicestershire to get him. And obviously he's a reserve officer at, uh, at uh, Rutland Water. I've been racking my brains since Tim said he would give this talk on willows. Um, the link between willows and badgers it seems quite quite a long way away but uh, the best i could come up with it was mr badger feeding so highly in the wind of the wind in the willows so if tim can make that link I, i'll be grateful in any case i'm very pleased to welcome tim sexton who's going to give the talk on the wonders of willow so over to you tim well, thank you ever so much, David, for that lovely introduction. So as David mentioned, I've been with the Leicester and Rutland Wildlife Trust now since February as the Species and Recording Officer at Rutland Water. Um, I've been at Attenborough Nature Reserve for the last 15 years, working with Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust before that. So I've had a, a long interest in conservation stemming from the age of about seven years old and a particular interest in invertebrates. So the link between my talk is, is, is invertebrates are very important within ecosystems for supporting a whole range of larger animals and mammals such as badgers. Um, but this particular talk looks at a project I did in my spare time a few years back, looking at the importance of willow um, to invertebrates. Um, so what I'll do is I will start sharing my screen in a second, but I've got pretty poor internet signal. So just because I've got some large photos in the talk, I'll turn my video off for the talk. So I hope you don't mind that. And uh, it just means that the slides will work slightly better. So if you just bear with me a second. So hopefully you can all see that now. Okay, so the wonder of willow, like I mentioned, um, this was a project I, I started a couple of years ago looking at Attenborough Nature Reserve's willow trees and the importance and the association they have with invertebrates. Now, everyone needs to have a champion. And in conservation circles, I think the oak is often championed um, as being uh, the species that supports the most number of ver and, and variety of invertebrates and other wildlife. Um, and here is uh, just up the road from me in Nottinghamshire, the major oak in Sherwood Forest, which I'm sure many of you have all been to and are familiar with. Um, and the inspiration for this talk came from a journal article that was written back in 1961, um, but has been revised since by a, a chap called T.R.E. Southwood. And what he looked at was the associations of different insects with different tree species in the UK. He revisited the work in 1984, and it was looked again um, by a couple in British Wildlife um, magazine in uh, Butler and Green in 2006. Um, we had our own major oak of Attenborough, although because we were right on the Trent Valley, oaks weren't that dominant in the landscape and, and we had very few mature oaks. So I suppose the inspiration really then came that we needed to have our very own champion for, for wildlife and champion for species. So I looked at the willow and uh, here's one of my tasty bar charts here, my chocolate bar chart if you like, and this shows the, um, the findings that, that Southwood had. So he found that oak supported around 266 species of invertebrate. Um, these are ones that are directly associated with the tree. Um, willow came in a close second, um, and, and then, but after that was birch, hawthorn, hazel, and, and sycamore, which supports the fewest um, species. Now, of course, the value depends on the age of the tree. Um, older trees have a greater variety of microhabitats within them. Different species may also be associated with different stages um, of the tree's life cycle. So if, for instance, you might get species on the flowers alone or the fruits, the leaves or deadwood. 
Um, and as I mentioned, willows are abundant um, at Attenborough Nature Reserve as they are across much of the Trent Valley. And in some cases, they're the tallest trees in the landscape. Another one of my tasty charts here, this is my apple pie chart. Um, and I've just slipped this in, just to show you the bias between recording. And I, I think this probably goes to, uh, is very relevant to Rutland Water as well. So if we look at the pie chart, the smallest piece of the apple pie, which is normally the piece that my wife gets, is the bit in the bottom left-hand side, which is for birds and mammals. Now birds, like here at Rutland Water, tend to get the lion's share of the interest. Whereas in fact, invertebrates, which are, I've already said are incredibly important within the ecosystem, make up you know, almost half, if not more, of the total number of species that are found on the reserve. Then you've got vascular plants, which are also incredibly important, and then the fungi, the lichens, and the bryophytes that make up the last chunk there. Um, so when you go to Attenborough, for those of you that have ever have been there, you may have seen this tree, the golden weeping willow that meets you as you go into the visitor's centre. Um, this is often regarded as Britain's iconic waterside tree. It's a hybrid between say, Salix alba and Salix babylonica, which is uh, sometimes referred to as the Chinese weeping willow. What I quite like about that is we're not quite sure how the Chinese weeping willow arrived in Britain. And there's some suggestions that arrived on uh, as a basket of fruit many hundreds of years ago. And when the fruit was finished, they threw the basket out, uh, which was made from woven willow and uh, the basket grew into the first of the trees. So it's quite an interesting uh, story behind that. Now, before I started this study, I was quite naive to the variety of willows. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I thought there were just ones with, you know, thin leaves, ones with broad leaves. Uh, didn't really think much of it. And it was only when I started really looking into the, the willows that I realized just how many different species they are. And in fact, there's over 400 in the world, which can be split into three main groups, which are the tree willows, the shrub willows, and then the smaller alpines. At Attenborough, we've got um, around 25 species, hybrids or varieties. So you've got seven main species, a white willow, crack willow, osier, purple, almond, goat willow and grey willow. And they can be split into a mind boggling array of different hybrids. And they have a remarkable abil ability to form hybrids, which makes identification really difficult. And I, I sometimes cite that as being the reason why I've not looked at them in much detail in the past, because they really are tricky. And even the, some of the best botanists, you know, we have in this country find it very difficult to split them up. Um, now, these hybrids form when species within the same subgenus um, flower at the same time and you get cross pollination. When it comes to identifying willows, there's some easy things you can look for. You can look at features such as the bark, the twigs, the buds, the leaves, both the upper side and the underside have quite distinct features a lot of the time. You look at the leaf veins, the edge shape, whether they're toothed or smooth, uh, whether they have hairs or so pubescence. And then you can look at the flowers and again, the shape, the size and even the flowering time can be quite unique among species. And willows are uh, dioecious, so the plants are either male or female, so they have male uh, parts or, or female flowers. So the male flowers have these long filaments with a pollen sac at the end in the top left hand corner. And then you can see the bottom right hand corner, the female, which has got the bulbous ov ovaries with a stigma at the end. Um, although there is one that sort of throws a spanner in the work, which is our, our friend, the golden weeping willow, which sort of has half female flowers and half male flowers, which you can see the male part at the end and the female part at the bottom. Um, the willows spread rapidly by seed and they have fine fluffy seeds and the ability to spread depends on a number of factors, particularly the overlap of flowering times between the male and the female plant. So if you imagine the male plant flowers at a different time to the female plant, it's unlikely that they're gonna pollinate each other and be able to um, produce catkins, which then burst open to these wonderful seeds. Um, if they are pollinated, the, the female catkins can produce tens of thousands of seeds that can be dispersed over long distances by the wind. And it's one of the reasons they're so successful around our wetland sites. In fact, if you look at poplars historically within the UK, which is one of particularly the black poplar, one of our rarest native trees, 
um, historically large numbers of females were, were systematically removed from the landscape because they were considered too messy. So the, the fluff that was produced from the female black poplar trees was too messy. And in fact, a survey that was carried out quite locally in Cambridgeshire found that only 4% of the remaining native black poplars were female. Um, and I think it was the Victorian era that this sort of widespread removal in the landscape took place. So for willows to be able to set seed, um, they need to find a suitable seed bed. They've got to find stable water levels, no flooding events that might uproot or cover the seedlings and certainly no drought. So you can walk around Attenborough in the spring and it looks like you've just had snowfall where you get so many of these willow seeds appearing. They go all over the water um, and eventually they'll find some suitable habitat to, to, to set. Um, at Attenborough, uh, sand and gravel extraction from 1929 created just that habitat that they were looking for, you know, bare earth um, along the Trent Valley. Um, and you can see there an aerial shot of Attenborough as it is today. And you can see the areas of nice mosaic of, of woodlands, grasslands um, and scrubby areas that make it so wonderful for its wildlife. Uh, willow certainly likes to have its roots wet, so the reed beds around Attenborough used to provide the perfect growing medium. And as Dave Duckett will, will, will tell you, I'm sure, you know, managing the reed beds at, at Rutland can be just as, as tricky. So um, we have to remove a lot of the willows from the reed beds, otherwise if they were to take hold, they'll very quickly dry out the reed bed and eventually it would um, turn through succession back to woodland at some point in time. Um, willow, besides spreading by seeds, can spread vegetatively. So you can see there was some management work that took place. A, a large sort of branch of willow was cut down. And because it was left in just a perfect habitat, nice and wet, nice and mulchy, it was able to actually root from the branch and to continue to grow into another tree. Um, and uh, it's, it's safe to say it's incredibly difficult to kill willow. It's, it's very persistent and it, I mean, it's a fantastic plant for, for, for nature. Now, willow um, has been grown commercially in Attenborough for many years. We can see this map here adapted from Sanderson in 1835. Um, and you can see the red marks just at the top there and at the bottom, which would have been willow holts at the time. And in fact, we can even go back further than that. And if we look at the Doomsday Book in 1086, you can see just there a reference to in Chilwell, and Chilwell is just on the border of Attenborough Nature Reserve, and it talks there, I won't translate it all for you, um, but about a willow holt being there. And indeed, willow holts were once a feature of many Trentside villages, um, and Farndon Willow Holt near Newark is one of the few remaining survivors today. Uh, the site was previously owned there by a chap called Richard Lever Howitt and his wife Barbara, who in the 50s uh, restored and built up the Willow Collection. And uh, Richard inherited it from his father and then Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust actually acquired the site in 1986. Um, Richard uh, Howitt was um, also, he was an incredible botanist um, and he was famed for writing The Last Floor of Nottinghamshire as well. So the site there at, at Farndon has an arboretum which was replanted in 2006 with the help of local residents and Farndon Wildlife Watch Group um, and is now looked after by the Farndon Residents um, Environmental Group. And uh, there's some 45 species of willow and hybrids within the collection. So here's just a, a selection, including the top right there, basewood willow, which is a, a local cultivar, um, and some more of the broadleaf willows there. Um, and some of the ancient pollards at, at Farndon are well over 300 years old. So they have value that goes beyond um, invertebrates for wildlife. So certainly bats would make use of this. Um, and, and in some of the other um, you know, old pollards, certainly tawny owls and the likes, and little owls. One of the other lovely features, which um, unfortunately every time I go there seems to be dried out, is uh, the wetting ponds. And these were historically used for soaking the willow prior to the willow being stripped to then be used in basketry. Um, interestingly, most of the stripping at the time, sort of in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, was done by women and children. And certainly up to the early 1900s, around 1920, pupils from the local schools would actually have their summer holidays in May so that the children could help strip the willow um, and support the, the, the businesses. 
And indeed, some of the most ancient crafts are associated with willow. It's, um, it's reported that Moses' basket was, was made from willow. And indeed, coracles, uh, which are a type of, if you like, uh, half walnut shell boat, um, is considered to be one of the earliest forms of basketry. And this possibly dates back to the Bronze Age. It was certainly um, noted by Julius Caesar in his invasion of Britain and used then during his campaigns in Spain. Um, they're essentially this half shell, uh, a framework of, of split and interwoven willow rods and then tied together with, with willow bark. And you might think who on earth would, would attempt using a boat like that, but um, just at the top in the red t-shirt there is one of my former colleagues from Attenborough, Pete, who was an avid builder of coracles, and this is the, um, the, the coracle regatta at Ironbridge, and they're having a game of coracle polo. So I've never given it a go myself, I do a lot of paddleboarding, I thought I wouldn't mind uh, trying it at some point with Pete. And indeed, willow growing, harvesting and basket making was a very important source of employment in, in Nottinghamshire in the 19th century. And it's certainly one of the oldest uh, industries associated within the area. And if you consider sort of 1881, there are almost 500 basket makers in Nottinghamshire. And one of the most famous was a local Nottinghamshire man um, and basket maker to Queen Victoria called William Scaling. And in the 1861 census, he apparently employed 27 men, 26 boys and 27 girls um, at his basket making factory, making him the largest employer in the time in the UK in, in, in willow industry. Um, certainly both during the wars, uh, willow growers and basket makers thrived. And in Castle Donington, just outside of Attenborough, uh, there was a famous basket makers who used to make bomb baskets during the Second World War. Um, they would have also made baskets for transporting pigeons, carrier pigeons that, that, that take messages um, from the front line. Um, and then following the war, um, it became policy to train soldiers that had been blinded by gas attacks into the trade of basketry. And indeed, it was used as a therapy for returning soldiers. But it was really the, the war that brought an end to the willow industry in the UK. Um, one of the other great properties of willow, of course, that some people may be aware of, is that the bark contains salicylic acid, which was used as a, as a painkiller. And there was a, a chemist called Henry LaRue who isolated it first in 1828 in its crystalline form. And then later on, it was extracted in its pure form by an Italian chemist. Um, and it wasn't until a chap called Felix Hoffman in 1897 created a synthetically altered version um, that caused far less stomach upsets than salicylic acid. And of course, we all know that today as aspirin. And when I was putting this talk together, I, I, I wondered whether perhaps that's the reason why woodpeckers don't get headaches when they're, um, when they're banging trees. Who knows? Anyway, a far more specialist use of willow in modern times is, is the production of timber for the manufacture of cricket bats. And it's something where in Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust, we worked very closely with Gunn and Moore, a local cricket bat um, suppliers, um, to plant cricket bat willows uh, specifically for that purpose. And when the trees are over 10 years old and at a girth of 1.5 meters, they're ready for, for processing and could be made into cricket bats. And in fact, just last year, we started um, putting together the, the next crop, if you like, of, of um, cricket bat willows, um, not at Fund and Willow Holt, but are at our um, Idle Valley Nature Reserve in the north of the county. Um, so there's some pictures of the cricket bat willows and uh, another modern use for willows is, is biofuels. So short rotation coppice where around 15,000 cuttings are planted per hectare. Um, and this is just south of Sherwood Forest um, in, in Knotts and it's a, a biofuel plantation. There's been lots of willow varieties trialled in Sweden who are deemed to be the world leaders in, in um producing energy from biomass and about 25% of their energy comes from biomass. But we're catching up really in the UK. I think there's something like 225 biomass plants now, um, including a few in, in Leicestershire. So let's look at some of the wildlife and what makes willows so attractive to, to insects, which is uh, where my area of expertise comes in, in handy. And, 
Um, I was driving back from Idle Valley one afternoon and I spotted this uh, Jamaican street food cafe in Arnold in Nottingham and, and I thought it would be a perfect illustration for my talk, the tasty willows. So what is it that makes willows so tasty? Well, to begin with, uh, they flower very early in the year. They're one of the main sources of pollen and nectar in early spring and they produce copious amounts of flowers as well. So they're very attractive to many species of bee. Um, when Southwood did his study, he found some 100 species of different hymenoptera, so bees, wasps, um, and the likes that are associated with willow flowers. Uh, this species is called Andrina clarkella, which is quite unique. There's around 25 species of Andrina that, that feed on willow pollen. And some, um, whilst many are generalists, some are, are specialists, so that like Andrina clarkella, they will only feed on willow blossom and that's the only pollen that they'll they'll collect. You also get lots of flies like these dung flies that will feed on the pollen and surprisingly to many you'll also get birds that visit um, willow trees in the spring to feed up um, not on the insects but on the pollen itself and far from being um, a last resort for, for, for emaciated birds it's actually a valuable source of really easily, digest uh, easily digested carbohydrates at a time of year when of course you know the breeding season birds have very high energy demands. Um, there are a number of really nice moths as well that are um, specialist willow pollen feeders. This is a, a micro moth and again one of my sort of areas of expertise. It's a um, micro lepidoptera, um, Adela cuprella, which is only eight millimeters long, but it's got these incredible um, antennae in the male. And in some cases, they're up to two and a half times longer than the body length of the male. And the larvae actually feed on the sallow catkins. So the adults feed on, on the pollen, they'll lay their eggs on the catkins, the larvae will hatch and feed on the catkins, and then they'll drop to the ground where they later feed on the willow leaves. And they fly from April to May, so only when the, the willow blossoms out, um, and they're often around the top of sallow bushes, so you can look out for them in the early spring. They're sort of dancing around, we often call them the fairies at the bottom of the garden because they've got this lovely fairy-like appearance to them. Um, and the larvae actually construct a case in the shape of a violin, which they actually live inside for protection, slowly building up the case to about two centimetres in total. So much bigger than the actual larvae that they feed inside. Uh, but there are about 100 species of macro moth um, associated with, with willow overall and around seven, 70 species of micro moth. And this one is called the blossom underwing, which is, is unusual in that it's a macro uh, moth that feeds per, uh, just exclusively on, on willow blossom. So other moths will feed on um, you know, flowers from other plants. They're quite generalist, but this one will only feed on willow blossom. Um, when I found this, it was the first one that had ever been recorded on the reserve um, at Attenborough. So they've been recording moths, much the same as Rutland Water for sort of some 30 or 40 years, and they'd never seen this one before. So maybe it's one that's moving further north um, as a result of climate change. Uh, but they fly in March and April and interestingly the larvae actually are associated with oak rather than willow so the adults feed on on the flowers of the willow but the larvae feed on on the oak leaves and indeed from the moment the the willow leaves first open up they become under attack from a whole host of many different species uh, this is the larvae of the winter moth which um, if you're driving anywhere over the next few weeks, you, I'm sure you'll come familiar with as the weather gets colder and we start moving into November, you'll start seeing the winter moth appear in your headlights when you're driving along country roads. They're very common in Britain. Um, they, um, they're active as adults in the coldest months of the year, you know, so from November through to March um, at the latest, and they have this special antifreeze protein in their blood, which stops it from, from freezing and enables them to be active in that, those very cold times, often at sub-zero temperatures. And this is the adult on the left, you've got the male, and quite interestingly, with a lot of the winter flying species, the female looks very different indeed. So the female you know, almost looks nothing like a moth at all and is often confused for something completely different. But because they have such high energy demands during the winter, they're literally just laying eggs. They're just an egg laying machine. The they release pheromones, the males go and seek out the pheromones. They do all the hard work flying around and then the, the, the females mate with the males. 
Uh, the winter moth is hugely important, of course, for, for blue tits. Um, and uh, in a breeding season, you know, a brood of blue tits can eat anything up to a couple of thousand winter moth caterpillars. And when I took that photo of the, the caterpillar earlier on, um, I went out purposefully looking for them and it took me hours just to find one caterpillar, although there must be huge numbers of them on willow trees. And, uh, you know, I take my hat off to blue tits for their ability to be able to find caterpillars, because if you look for even some of the biggest moth caterpillars, it can be really tricky. And, uh, you know, people think moths are brown, boring things. And, um, you know, one of the, probably one of the most spectacular moths, certainly the macro moths in the UK is, is a willow feeder um, as a larvae. And this is the red underwing, which they're coming to the end of their flight time now, but certainly through much of late September and early October, you'll see them flying around, coming to light. In fact, our Linden Visitors Centre at Rutland here gets them on the stonework of the building where they come to the security lights. And the larvae are incredibly tricky to find. Um, they tend to um, feed up during the night and then they'll drop down to the bottom of the, the, the trunk of the willow during the daytime. Um, so they're hidden away from hungry predators. The larvae are quite big. They're about five centimetres long. They're quite impressive, almost as impressive as the, as the adult moss. And equally as difficult to find has to be the eyed hawk moth larvae. Um, but if you look around on a willow tree, you soon get proficient at finding certainly the larger moth caterpillars because you look for the droppings, the frass, and they leave behind these telltale signs that they've been feeding up. So you start seeing stripped leaves, you'll start seeing piles of the black frass um, building up around where they're feeding. And then if you look under some of the leaves, you might be lucky enough to find these wonderfully camouflaged caterpillars. And again, the moths, you know, they, they're always crowd pleasers whenever we do a, a moth demonstration and we do some public moth trapping events. The eye talk moth, you can't quite see the eyes that are on the underwing here, um, but that when they get alarmed, they'll, they'll flash those and try and scare off whatever it is that's trying to eat them. Interestingly, with the eye hawk moth and indeed the poplar hawk moth, which is another um, willow feeder, is they don't feed as adults. So all of the energy reserves that they've built up as a larvae will see them through to their adulthood. Um, and they live for some time, sort of a month and a half, um, you know, six weeks as an adult. And they're, they're impressive sized moths. You can imagine a good meal for a bat, perhaps. And uh, whilst I was doing my caterpillar searching, I found this very tiny caterpillar and I knew it would be one of three species. I'd encountered some of them before, but at that size, and bear in mind this um, in the photo looks big, but they're probably only about three millimeters. You can see the one on the right hand side is actually the molt from the one on the left hand side. So it's already done one of its growth stage molts. And so it's probably only about a millimeter or two across. Um, so I took it back with me for my kids. I've got two, two young children, four and nine, who absolutely love wildlife. And I thought it'd be a good little project for them to try and rear them. So we kept feeding it. We'd go out and get some, um, get some goat willow every day and we'd get, watch it grow bigger and bigger. Um, it started getting this whip-like little flagelle on the tails. At this stage, I knew exactly what it was. Um, and it grew even bigger. It's like the very hungry caterpillar story. And eventually um, it's built a, a very hard case around its body called a cocoon. Um, and in fact, the puss moth, which this species is, is world renowned for having the hardest cocoon of any moth species, pretty much. And it really is solid. So the, the, the larvae will chew up some bark of some wood, normally willow. Um, and it will mix it with saliva and its silk and build this really, really firm case that when it needs to emerge from the following July, so bear in mind it pupates around sort of um, June, July time, and it will stay in the pupa throughout the winter until sort of, you know, the early summer at least. It then has to um, eject this sort of acidic saliva which dissolves the, the pupil case and it emerges as just one of the most incredible moths I think I've ever encountered. Um, they come from a family of the kittens so you've got there's a sallow kitten and indeed the poplar kitten and then the puss moth as well. I think it's because they look like a, a cat stretched out or a kitten you know with those fluffy legs. One of the other larvae that you can look for in willows is certainly when you're cutting willows down. So if we're coppicing, I'll always keep an eye around the coppice stools to see if there's any telltale signs. 
and a species, again, a caterpillar that I've looked for lots in the UK, but been unsuccessful and eventually found one in Eastern Europe in the Czech Republic, um, is this species, which we do get and is common as, as an adult moth, but just incredibly difficult to find as a larvae, which is the goat moth. And the larvae take so long to grow. They grow up to 10 centimetres when they're ready to pupate that they take you know, five years to develop um, within the bark of, of a willow uh, stump. Um, and uh, they get their name goat moth from the fact that the larvae smell a little like a goat. Um, it's a nationally notable species, so it's quite rare. And it's one of only three species of the Cossidae family that we get in the UK, which of course includes the leopard moths. Um, and there's the adult there. I had to borrow this from a, a chap called Trevor Pendleton because I'm still yet to see either the adults or the, the larvae in the UK, which is a real shame. Uh, another group of moths which are uh, absolutely stunning are the clearwing moths. And these uh, basically use a special cryptic camouflage to, to um, look like something else completely different to them. So they want to look like wasps or hornets in this case. And this is the lunar hornet clearwing. It's about three to four centimeters long. So again, a really brilliant moth to see. And you'll often see them resting on, when they emerge from the, the, the bark, the, you'll see them resting on the tree trunk. Certainly the females will rest up as they're releasing pheromones to attract the males. They're actually listed as common, but they're really quite difficult to find again. And they in fact overwinter twice as a larvae. So in the first year, they feed on the roots of willow under the bark. And then in the second year, they feed slightly higher up, so about a metre high, um, until they eventually then emerge in the, the, the late spring. And it's not just moths, of course, that feed on willows. We also get butterflies as well, and one in particular, which again, I think you'll agree, is just one of the most stunning species of butterflies we get in this country, which feeds on goat willow. And indeed, some of the ancient woodlands, the older woodlands around the Hamilton Peninsula here, I know we occasionally see the purple emperor butterfly, um, you may have your favourite spots. I know there's other sites within Leicestershire that are, are really particularly good for them. They feed on goat willow, but they'll also feed on grey willow and sometimes crack willow as well. Um, the adults always fly really high in the canopy, which is a real shame for photographers like me that want to get our lovely photos of the butterflies because the only time they come down to ground is when they're looking to get salt. So when they're flying up in the canopy, they're feeding on aphid honeydew um, and tree sap as an adult butterfly. They'll feed on the leaves as a larvae, but when they come to ground, they're looking to get salt, which they often find on dog poo. And the only time, obviously, then you can get a photo of them on the ground tends to be when they're sitting on a dog poo. And this is the only photo I have where it's sitting on anything other than. So it's a, a difficult thing to get a picture of um, in particular because you want to get a nice composition too. Um, the other caterpillars you might find are sawflies. Uh, obviously, the main difference between sawfly caterpillars and moths and butterflies is uh, the number of pro legs. So you've got six legs like every insect has. Uh, three pairs at the front near the head and then the pro legs are like the fleshy fleshy muscular stumps that they use to, to, to hang on to the leaves and for locomotion, which you can see at the back there. And sawflies either have between uh, six or more pairs of pro legs and butterflies and moths only have five pairs. So if you're never sure whether you've got a sawfly or a, a moth or a butterfly caterpillar, always count the pro legs. The other thing uh, is it doesn't have the crochet like hooks um, on the pro legs and also it only has one stomata which is the the eye spot and butterflies and moths have six. So I took a, quite an interest in sawflies actually whilst I was doing this project because there are around 50 or so species associated with willows and many appear as galls which are most obvious and really easy to ID even if you can't ID um, the larval stage or the adults of sawflies which can be quite tricky. Um, and one of them that I found when I was at Idle Valley um, nature reserve was this one, the red margin willow sawfly. Now it's it's about um, as a larvae, uh, probably about five, six centimeters long. It's pretty big as far as sawfly caterpillars go. Uh, Trichosoma vitellinae. Um, it's, it's described as rarely found in the UK. And in fact, if you look at the NBN gateway map, um, there's only four spots um, on the map. So incredibly rare to find and, and got a few sawfly hunters quite excited or went out looking for it themselves there. But here's an example of some of the, the ghouls that you get on, on Willow. You can see 
um, Pontania Proxima, the top left hand side and the top right hand side there, which is often called um, the bean gall. And then you've got some uh, pea galls on the bottom, Eupontania viminalis on the left hand side and Pontania pedunculi on the, the right, which differs because it's got all these little tiny hairs on there and doesn't have the red spots. Um, and here's a, an adult of one of the Pontania saw flies. Now, my favourite area of, of study has to be beetles, and in particular weevils. As a, as a photographer, um, they lend themselves to the lens. Most of them are really tiny. So this species um, is the willow gall weevil, Arcaria salicivorus. It's only two and a half millimetres across, so it's really tiny. But it's got this really neat trick of uh, predating the gall, the, the Pontania sawfly galls. So what the female weevil will do is it will drill into the gall and lay its egg inside the gall and then the larvae of the weevil will feed on the larvae of the sawfly. So you think if you didn't have the willow tree you wouldn't have the sawflies and then you wouldn't have the weevil that's associated with them. Now, beetles in general, um, the vast majority are, are associated. So 64 species are associated with willows altogether. Um, some of which like the Chrysomelidae, the leaf beetles, they have potential to cause quite a lot of damage indeed. So the eggs look like ladybird eggs, the little tiny yellow um, um, sort of elongated um, eggs. And uh, the larvae of the Chrysomelidae feed gregariously often as a group um, on the lower dermis of the leaves. Um, and this one, the, the brassy willow beetle, which the, the larvae were on the previous slide there, um, they feed quite gregariously as well as adults and they feed on the upper dermis um, and they can cause quite a lot of damage and indeed also defoliation as well. Um, but studies have shown that actually the damage that they cause is purely cosmetic um, and doesn't actually affect the willow tree much at all. Um, obviously in commercial plantations it might be quite a problem where, where yields are really important, but some on a, on a nature reserve, you know, it's all part of the, the, the ecosystem and part of the, the flora and fauna here. Um, this one's probably one of my favourite of the Chrysomelidae, just because of its name. So it's called the imported willow beetle, Plagidodera versicolora. Um, but it's a bit of a misnomer, the, the common name imported willow beetle, because actually it's native to the UK and it was introduced to North America. So you may have heard of all these North American species that have come over here in plant imports. Um, so actually it should be called the exported willow beetle, in my opinion. And it was sent over to America during the First World War, apparently. Um, look at willow leaves in the summer and you'll almost certainly see willow flea beetles as well. Um, there's a number of species associated with them. Uh, they're all from the family Crepidodera. You've got Fulvicornis on the top left hand side, Plutus on the top right. And then the two bottom ones are the same species, but you can get two different colour morphs. So it's always good to look at the structural characteristics of them rather than the colours. Um, and that's um, Crepidodera aurata. Uh, but my favourite of all has to be the musk beetle, and this is one of the longhorn beetles. It's probably, in terms of body length, the largest beetle that we have in the UK, uh, Aromia muscata, and it gets its name from this quite pleasant smell that it releases when alarmed. And the larvae feed in the, the, the wood um, of willow, particularly pollarded willows, where they develop for some three years before they emerge as an adult. Now, I know there's a lot of entomologists, particularly in Derbyshire and in Leicestershire, that haven't seen this species and, and are you know, always looking for it. I get calls all the time and emails saying, let me know, Tim, when you see the um, when you see the musk beetle at Attenborough, because we'll start looking for it nearby in the corner, you know, in the junction of Leicestershire, Nottinghamshire and, and, and Derbyshire, because they want to get it on their like little tick lists as well. Uh, but, you know, they, we had quite a stronghold for them at, at Willow and at, at Attenborough. And I think it's all the Willow pollarding um, that we've done there over the years that's really benefited this species. And the fact that we've got lots of really wet, damp woodland as well. Um, early in the spring, moving away from beetles, you might see this, what looks like cuckoo spit that you might see in the grasslands during the summer months. Um, and it's caused by a, a species of frog hopper, the Afrophora salicina, which is quite a rare species, but I found quite, a, you know, it was quite abundant at Attenborough. I've not seen it anywhere else really in the county um, or neighbouring counties. 
And if you just brush some of the bubbles away, you'll see the nymphs underneath all the bubbles and they use the, the, this froth to protect them from predators. Um, they feed on the, the, the tree sap like many true bugs do. They've got like a, almost like this pointed drinking straw that they use to stab into the bark and then they suck out the sap and it's the fermented tree sap that creates these bubbles um, from their bottom. And Jake, my son, particularly likes these and he always tries to copy them whenever he has a bubble bath and trumping in the bath to try and make some protective um, coating for him. Like the, uh, like the frog hopper. The adults are actually quite large. It took me a couple of years actually before I found an adult, despite finding lots of nymphs. They're about one centimeter in length. Um, and indeed the, the, the leaf hoppers, which are a similar, um, similar family, um, a, a large number associated with willows. In fact, 22 in total are associated with them. This one's Idioceris stigmaticalis. They don't really have common names in a lot of cases, um, but there's actually seven species in the, the Idioceris family alone. Notoriously difficult to identify. Um, there's a really good website, which is run by a chap called Tristan Bantock called British Bugs. And I'd highly recommend if you're interested in, in Hemiptera, um, looking at his website. Um, and along the lines of the Hemiptera, the Homopterans, you've got the aphids. And now there's about 30 species of aphids associated with, with willows. Um, whilst many of them feed on the foliage, some of the larger species have adapted specialist mouthparts, enabling them to feed on the bark. Um, I found a, a number of different species that have that strategy. This is the, the hairy willow aphid. Um, I also found one called Terracoma salicis, which again is quite rare. Um, there's only about eight or nine records across the country. I'm sure it's down to under recording more rather than, um, you know, they genuinely are scarce. But mm, there's not a lot of people other than gardeners, I suppose, looking out for aphids. And then the, the, the intentions of gardeners are probably far worse than perhaps mine would be. Um, but probably the, oh, there's a, a map there just to show you the distribution. Um, I think there's been a couple of spots added since. Uh, probably the most interesting of any of the species I looked at um, uh, uh, on the willow and of which I introduced a few of my volunteers to the other day on some of the willows here at Rutland is the giant willow aphid, Tubolacnus salignus. Now this is reported to be the largest aphid in the world. They grow to about eight millimetres in length. Um, this is an adult here. Um, and what's fascinating about them is they've been studied in great detail that they're only exists in female form so no males have ever been found in this species anywhere across the planet so they're found on pretty much every continent except for Antarctica um, but there's only about 27 distinct genotypes found of this species so they've produced purely by, um, by, by producing clones of themselves so they're live bearers pathogenesis um, and, and um, in the females they actually have developing with inside them their granddaughters. So you've got the female, you've got the, the, the baby of the female, and within that baby, you've already got developing the granddaughter, which is absolutely incredible. Um, another thing that's, that's really interesting about them is the time of year that they're active. So if you look on Willow now, you should be able to find them. So they appear in August, um, and they're active throughout the coldest months of the year. So all the way through to about March, when for some reason they just completely disappear. Nobody really knows, despite all the studies that's been done on them, where they go. Truth is, they probably just hide away in some cracks under the bark, bark somewhere and just sort of disperse over the whole tree. And it would be very difficult to spot them. But we really don't know where they go for the winter. And as you can see there, I went out one frosty day, this winter just gone, and found them just moving around with massive ice crystals growing on them. Um, and they're just as active as they would have been, say, for instance, at the end of August. So absolutely incredible. Um, Willows, I mentioned earlier, are incredible, uh, incredibly difficult to, to kill off, you know, um, but eventually they do die. They create some wonderful standing deadwood. There's a couple of fantastic beetles associated with the deadwood, um, some wonderful fungi. Um, you've got the willow bracket there, uh, Felinus uh, igniarius, igne sorry. Um, you've got the artist bracket, whilst, what, whilst it's not uh, exclusive to, to willow, you do often find on willow, and then the willow shield in the bottom right there. And what I like about the artist bracket at the top there is you can see this one um, has been absolutely covered with the, the willow, uh, the, um, 
the gall fly. Um, uh, uh, I've totally forgotten the name. It's got a very long name. Um, I'll remember it in a second. Um, and then uh, one of the um, fungi I found on the, the leaves of willow. So if you've probably heard of um, a tar spot on sycamore. Um, and this is the willow tar spot, which is uh, Ritisma salicinum. Um, and again, it's incredibly rare. So I found it in about two other spots. So in North Knots and again in the south at Attenborough, but haven't really seen it anywhere else. Um, so again, a good one to look out for. And as I mentioned before, the fantastic beetles that you get living on, on Deadwood. You've got the lesser stag beetle there, two stag beetle species, and um, the, the rhinoceros beetle, and uh, one of our smallest species of stag beetle. So unfortunately in Leicestershire, we don't get the proper stag beetle that you get down in the south, down in London. But the lesser stag beetle is only a couple of centimetres across. But when you blow it up on a macro image, it's equally as, as, as impressive as the stag beetle, if not more so. Um, and I'll just finish off with one that I've discovered for the first time ever for myself um, since I've come over to Rutland, and it's uh, one that's been studied in great detail this year. We've seen this species of, of damselfly spread across the county, and there's been a lot of recorders out looking for these, which is the willow emerald damselfly. And what's unique about this species of damselfly, um, apart from the fact that, of course, it was um, only really um, found in Britain to be breeding in around 2007, I believe it was, down um, in Suffolk. And they've spread northwards, as many dragonflies and damselflies have. Um, but it's their life cycle that's quite interesting. So the females actually lay their eggs in the twigs and branches of willow overhanging water. Um, the eggs will stay in there throughout the winter until the following spring. And then the larvae will hatch out in the early spring, drop into the water below. And it takes just two or three months before they're ready to emerge as, a, as an adult damselfly again. Now, when you consider some damselflies and dragonflies will stay as a larvae for up to five years in the water, that's quite incredible. And you can differentiate certainly the females um, from uh, the female of the common emeralds. If you look at the, um, if you can see my mouse there, if you look at the pterostigma, it's creamy white in the um, emerald, uh, the southern, the, uh, willow emerald damselfly and it's black in the emerald the common emerald damselfly um, so there we go as often as i do end a, a talk on a beautiful sunset overlooking attenborough church i'm sure i'll have plenty of sunsets over rutland soon um, to to entertain people with my talks of rutland soon so thank you for listening and i'm open to any questions Oh, 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 Tim, I don't think there are any questions in as yet. Hopefully some will come in. Um, but let me say what a fascinating talk that was. Uh, and uh, I, the wonders of Willow were certainly demonstrated. And I was particularly uh, impressed by you citing my uh, professor for seven years, uh, Richard Southwood, and uh, Imperial College. So it was really great. Oh, it's uh, brilliant. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it just goes to show who you know. Yeah. I mean, he's <laughs> yeah. it, been often criticized over this work, and, and it's been proven, you know, by a number of people that he was right all along in terms of, you know, the number of species associated with willows. And in fact, um, it was Prof George McGavin. I, I bumped into at Idle Valley once, you know, the famous entomologist that you often see on yeah, TV. Yeah. And I raised this with him and he sort of laughed me out of the room almost, you know, it's like how ridiculous, you know, we all know oak is the, you know, the species that supports the most number of invertebrates. So I had to go out and prove it. And this was really what I did with, with this talk really. And, you know, putting this talk together. So, so yeah, you showed your uh, chocolate uh, histogram and how <laughs> well Willow performed against Oak. Well, not quite as well, but uh, do, do you know the actual rough number of species associated with Willow? Yeah, so if you look at all of the species, so, so I think it was Oak, um, Oak came in at about 280, uh, 86, and um, Willow was 266. But if you add mites onto that, so the Akari mites, actually willow supports more number of invertebrates than oak does which is quite interesting so um there are other species so i think if you look at the it depends on which way you look at the association so if it's purely associated with that one 
species, i.e. the tree, um, then it's the, the smaller number. But I think if you look at species that are associated with oaks and willows, but also other tree species, so they'll pollinate something else. It came in at something like 460 for the oak and 450 for the for the willows. So it's still a massive number and, and not that dissimilar really, to be honest. And the same goes for birch. I think birch was about 245 you know, compared to the 266. So I've, I've sort of given myself a couple of years off from this project, but I would really like to start looking at birch then and see just how many species we can find locally associated with birch. And perhaps that's something I can do here at Rutland in my spare time, who knows? Um, thank you, Tim. Um, Pam, are you uh, seeing questions coming? Because they are coming in on the chat line. Yes, I've got one from Janet Matthews. This year I saw a group of trees in Cossington Meadows covered in caterpillars which turned out to be the ermine moth. They were there in huge quantities. Will this happen again next year? Yeah, so most trees will have this sort of um, boom and bust cycle. So um, when the, the predator, if you like, in this case, the ermine caterpillars attack a tree, what the tree tends to do in the following year is it holds back fruits or it holds back leaves and doesn't produce as much. So it sort of naturally reduces the, 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 the load of, um, you know, the ermine moss. So there'll be less food for the ermine moss and you'll get this sort of dip and sort of, um, you know, this cycle where you'll see a high number of moths and then a, a low number of willows the following year, and then keep on moving up and down as it goes. So similar with um, the galls on, say, for instance, uh, oak acorns. You know, if you get the nopper gall in, in massive numbers in one year, um, then the, the oak tree doesn't produce so many acorns the following year. So the, the, the Andricus um, wasp, in this case, reduces in number that following year and it releases the pressure. So we've seen uh, the spindle ermine here at Rutland. And in fact, we get the, the uh, cherry ermine, the willow ermine as well locally. Uh, but the spindle ermine this year seem to be covering many of the trees I looked at. And they just they produce these massive sort of webs, uh, you know, nets of web over the plant where the caterpillars feed from inside them. But again, like the beetles, there's no evidence to show that they have any detrimental effect long term. Um, I suppose the problem comes when we get non-native species introduced that the trees haven't evolved alongside uh, and they don't know quite how to deal with them, which is where we're starting to see some problems in the landscape. I have a question from Stuart Mucklejohn. You mentioned that willows are very hard to kill. How do you calculate a typical lifespan for a willow tree? How do you find end of life for a willow tree? Yeah, so, so with some of the ancient pollards that were at um, Fondon Willow Holt, you can do a similar thing where, you know, when, when if they, they completely die and you have to cut them down, you can count the rings, for instance. Um, you can also use measurements with girth and look through historical data, comparing it to other species of trees to try and work out how fast the growth would have been within particular years based on the weather conditions of that year. So obviously in warmer, wetter years, they'll have more growth. In colder years, you'll have less growth or in drier years. So you can use a number of calculations to work them out. I mean, really when, you know, we're managing willows here, which at Rutland or indeed at Attenborough, you know, within the reed beds, um, we have to um, coppice them. So cut them down to the ground and then um, sort of paint them over with a brush with, with a herbicide to, to stop them from regrowing. Otherwise they, you know, they grow vigorously the following year and you just have to continuously go out there every year with volunteers otherwise, which as David, I'm sure will tell you can get pretty strenuous and time consuming. Um, removing willows from reed beds um, but yeah I mean it's just a, a you know a, a wonderful tree and again locally to us here we don't have a huge number of ancient oak trees we have quite a few ancient ash trees which support a, a much lesser number of invertebrates um, but we should all be championing the willow really to be honest. Well, there's one from Bethan how often can you coppice willow without compromising its health? Well, normally we'd have a coppice rotation. I imagine David could probably tell you a bit more about this, perhaps. Um, do you know what the, the, the and is it every 13 years or 12 years that we normally do the coppice compartments here, David? It's probably near an eight to 10, I think, in general, but they seem to live forever. 
but it, it's usually rather than coppicing uh, on many of them, it's uh, pollarding where you're cutting at a higher level. Yeah, thank well, you. Everyone's, I've got a number of messages all thanking you for a great talk, Tim. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, it may be a bit different to what you're used to, perhaps, with the, with the Badger Group, but uh, you know, it's nice to, to look at other aspects as well, isn't it, of course? Uh, we, we always have varied the talks. Brilliant. You can't, you can't talk on badgers every time. <laughs> Good. So. Well, I hope I've entertained everyone. Yeah, in a yeah. year, we may have one or two on badger and or uh, fox or other big mammals, and then we tend to have more generalists because we're all generalists as well as uh, badger um, conservationists, I should say. Um, so, yeah. Are there any more questions? I don't think there are, Pam. Have you found any? I can't see any more, no. Um, well, let me give a big, big thank you to Tim for a wonderful talk. And uh, as Pam saying, we're getting lots of thanks coming in to you, Tim. Lots of congratulations, wonderful slides, wonderful talk. Uh, so thank you very much. Nice. Uh, and I'll hand you over to Harriet now to finish the uh, proceedings for the evening. And good night to everyone. Thank you, David. Um, thank you to David and Pam for um, organising the talk this evening. It's uh, definitely been very well received. And thank you, Tim, for joining us and um, giving us such an interesting insight into Willow. I learned lots there that um, I didn't know, especially the, the history of what Willow's been used for in the past. Very interesting. I used to live in Castle Donington, so that was uh, interesting to learn about that. Um, okay, well, thank you for joining us, everybody. We've had a great turnout this evening, and um, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. We've got a talk on Monday um, with the Rutland Local Group. Um, that's, uh, again, with another uh, one of our conservation officers. Uh, Claire Sandbridge will be talking all about the work that she's doing in the Saw and Reek area. So don't miss that one. You can sign up on our website um, for that, and uh, we shall see you all again soon. So. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody, and thank you again for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you.